hello, welcome to the Extreme Hangout. Thank you all for watching and for being here. My name's Mary Fellows. I am the Fashion Impact Director here at the Extreme Hangout. I'm also CEO and founder of Green With Studio, a sustainable fashion platform. First of all, just wanna say thank you, firstly to the Bedouins who put this tent up and made it possible for us to be here. Secondly, a big thank you to Amber and Al, the founders of Extreme Hangout and everybody who made this happen. And a special big thank you to all my panelists who've come to be here today looking over the sea, which is probably full of microplastics, thanks to fashion. Um, <laughs> this, uh, this talk is called Utopian Fashion. There's a reason for that. I was driving along thinking, you know, what a, watching, I'd, I'd seen a, a trailer for a Pixar film, and I was like, imagine if Pixar made a movie about the fashion industry being utopian. It'd be like, it's 2062, mm. and the bees are buzzing, and the crops are blowing in the breeze that become the fibers that become our clothes, and the workers have all got rosy, beaming faces, driving their electric vehicles, delivering clothing to different facilities, and all of that clothing is kind, and it puts back to the planet, and fashion is regenerative and fair, and everybody gets paid properly, and it's, it's this sort of wonderful utopia, but mm, is that ever gonna happen? And right now, the way that the fashion industry is going, with about 20% of the, the pollution to the world's water systems is, a, is attributable to fashion. It has more emissions than uh, shipping and aviation combined, and it's on course to more or less double the amount of clothing it produces uh, in the next 10 years. It's terrifying. Fashion is full of villains. It's literally like a Shakespearean or a Greek tragedy. It's, it's, it's dark versus light, bad versus good. So. If we know that we could get to utopian fashion, and what would it take? And that is the, the question I've put in my brilliant lineup of panelists here today. Now, I mentioned the sea, so we'll start with the sea, knowing that it is full of these microplastics that come out of the polyester clothing. And for those watching who don't know, polyester and all the other synthetic materials that you'll find listed in your clothing come from, guess who? Fossil fuels. And apparently there's more fossil, fossil fuel delegates here at COP27 than there are actual delegates from other organizations, which is terrifying. So if those are some of the evil dark lords of fashion and their product is, is, is choking the oceans and those microplastics are getting inside the blood-brain barrier, they're in our bodies, these microplastics, in our lungs, in our blood, then what do we do about it? My first question is for Lewis. Um, and if you could just tell us first a bit about what you do, and then um, I'd love you to tell us, given your experience um, of working across a lot of sectors, and now particularly in fashion, what fashion should be doing, and what would be your prescription to clean it up? Okay. Thank <laughs> you, thanks, Mary. Can, can you all hear me, or do I need a oh, mic? Yeah. yeah, okay, great, thank you. Um, so my name is Lewis Perkins, and I run an organization called the Apparel Impact Institute, and our mission is to identify, fund, scale, and measure solutions for people and planet related to climate, uh, water, di diversity, social, you know, all things. And we're really focusing in now on decarbonizing the supply chain of the fashion industry. So I'll tell you more about that later, but that's me. And then pr prior to this, I ran the Cradle to Cradle Products Innovation Institute, which was the third party standard that was focused on circular economy. But bigger than that, it really looked at five key pillars of the way we make and design products. And as you mentioned, across all product sectors, uh, I got started in the built environment uh, with products going to buildings, but we did personal care, we did packaging and, and fashion as well. And those five pillars, which I think are really a great framework for the issues to identify are, you know, the material itself and is it healthy and safe for all systems? Can it go back into itself for biological systems or technical systems? And then how it's made in terms of renewable energy, clean water stewardship and social fairness. And to me, that framework really kind of helps set a lot of the, the um, work that I've done and what sort of drew me to that whole philosophy to begin with. Uh, and a lot of what we're doing today is really creating those roadmaps to help suppliers to achieve that kind of future vision. So with that, your question was about the utopia, like what, is, what would I like to see? So, yeah, what would I prescribe? So it's interesting because I'm, as I said earlier when we were talking uh, back over here in our green room tent, there's no real right or wrong answer here because there's so much to do, right? There's so much to do in this industry. To me, there's a production problem and there's a consumption problem, and we have to address both sides of it. And I think um, oftentimes in organizations, we're focused on one side of the equation or the other. When I was at Cradle to Cradle, I was doing a lot more around circularity and engagement with consumer and ensuring that materials got back and what is that post-consumer relationship to circular economy, shared economy, 
Now at the Apparel Impact Institute, I'm really working on cleaning up the way we make clothes. But the real solution is to address the volume of what we're creating, the business models that are around how we create and relate to products uh, and materials and services uh, in this sector, in this industry. And then on the other side, that when we are making a brand new product, that we're ensuring that it is using the most regenerative systems of materials, of water, energy, and, and human, human livelihood. I mean, that's, that to me is the vision for the future. And then you can break that down, and the rest of this intelligent panel can <laughs> answer more on that or other things. And I'm just mindful that I got so excited talking about fashion and its, its villains that I didn't actually let our, the rest of our panelists introduce themselves. So before we go on to the deeper questions, Samatha, just quickly tell us who you are and what you've done before this and what you're doing. Philippe and Ava as well, please, if that's all right. Sure, sure, sure. And I love the villains thing, by the way. <laughs> um, so my name is Samatha Pattinson. Um, I am the CEO of an organization that was formerly called Red Carpet Green Dress. And we recently rebranded to RCGD Global, although we still have red carpet green dress under our umbrella. And we started as essentially a sustainable design competition founded by Susie and James Cameron the year they had Avatar. And they knew they were going to the Oscars, they knew they would be asked, what are you wearing? And they wanted to kind of facilitate a more meaningful conversation on the red carpet and talk about fashion's impact on people and planet. So we've grown to include internships, work experiences, um, educational programs across um, academic institutions around the world. We have a material innovation department now. We do brand consultancy work, and we also have a thought leadership that supports and intelligence to really try and essentially demystify sustainability and make sure that right. it's culturally representative. That's kind of, those are two things that mean a great deal to us. So thank, thank you. you for having me. Great, <laughs> Philippe, just tell, tell us a few about yourself. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, my name is Philippe Holmesy. Uh, I've been a villain for six years. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it's an interesting story that we were four guys who got into the fashion business with zero experience. Um, just had came one of the fastest growing brands in Europe. We had 66, uh, we were in 66 countries in all the best stores. We built 32 stores, you know, from Ginza to South Korea, to, um, one in, in Covent Garden. And uh, the better the business did, I think the worse we did from a moral conscious point of view. As we started to really see, you know, what it was like to work with factories in China and it was all about margin and it was about volumes and, you know, when you asked the questions about sustainability, it was just kind of brushed aside. Um, so I think after six years, we decided it wasn't for us, it wasn't what our, we wanted our legacy to be. Um, so long story short, we tore it all down uh, and we built a brand called Loki and we've been doing that for like uniting style and purpose uh, and just, yeah, just really enjoying the journey we're on. And it's mainly footwear, isn't it? It's, it's all footwear it's at the moment, footwear. yeah. Yeah, okay. That's Loki, L-O-C-I. And Ava, tell us about you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I might put all of the innovation and material science behind Thank you creation. very much. And I guess, and Ava, on that point as well, you know, before Pangaea, you ran the Global Fashion Agenda, which was responsible for really driving a lot of change and making, trying to make fashion cleaner, greener, and better. And to the same point that I said to Lewis, like, if you had a magic wand, if you had resources, whatever, what would you do? What would you prescribe to clean up the fashion industry? I would get rid of fast fashion. Okay. And I think it's actually a little bit saying the same, but in a different mm. way that, that Lewis is pointing mm. towards. The volumes is the biggest problem. Okay. Um, it's uh, the way it's produced, obviously. It's, mm. it's both how we source the natural resources, how what we do with them, the amount of chemical and energy and everything that goes into it mm. um, and into our, our world. It's exploitation of human labor. And, and the one trigger is it you're to an accelerated point is mm. the fast fashion industry mm. and the growth trajectory is more than double oh. in 2019 when we looked at the numbers we were going on a growth trajectory that said that we would grow 81 percent in volume 81. and of course i appreciate that it's not every wallet that can pay for expensive products mm. but then buy vintage yeah. or buy a little less and i know that that concept of buying less and buy you know looking at vo value creation rather than volume creation is a very difficult concept for an industry that is, or for a world, that is built around growth. We all believe we need to grow and grow and grow to be better and bigger and stronger and more. Um, but we need to simply reverse that conversation. So that's mm. a whole GDP conversation as well. Yes. Yeah. How our societies are built mm. for a growth model. Mm. Um, but what we're experiencing right now when we're in a financial crisis is that everybody's looking short-term incentives. How do I get you know, the best margins up against the next quarter and all of that. And I think we're in a vicious cycle on that. And I think yeah. we simply need, and, and that's where we need policies. You know, we need 
to yeah. call in policies we to help do. us legislate. How cheap can a product be? Yeah. When c can there be like a minimum yeah. price for a product? Yeah. Or even when fueling an industry where you can where you can make a good business by overproducing and marking down your product. Mm -mm. And it might even be a product that was cheap already. Yeah, exactly. And, and so what it, it makes absolutely no sense. Yeah. Thank you. And I think a question for both you and Philip in a way because you're both attached to product now, both of you. And for those people watching, let's let's just talk take a basic cotton t-shirt, okay? Cotton t-shirts, a farmer somewhere has got to grow that cotton, right? Then he's probably got to get buy some products, hopefully not too many pesticides. And that's going to cost him some money. He's got to buy the seeds first, and then he's got to plant them, and then spend his time, which is money, and then buy these pesticides or anything else he needs to treat his cotton. He's got to, got to tend to his cotton, grow it as a crop. Then someone's going to then take it, and it's got to be spun, harvested, cultivated, then taken somewhere else to be woven into a material, then taken somewhere else to be dyed, and somewhere else to be maybe printed on and cut and stitched. And then it's taken to a facility, to a warehouse, and then it's going to be distributed, and then it's got to get to the point of sale, and then it gets to the customer. How is it possible with all of those processes and materials that a t-shirt can cost the same amount as a takeaway cup of coffee? It just doesn't make sense. So who is paying the price? Not the customer. The people on the planet are paying the price of that. So I think the question that I'm sure lots of people watching this have who may, may be on a restricted budget would say, well, how, what, what more do I get? If I spend five pounds at Primark or Shein on t-shirt, instead I wait and I save up or I use Klan or I use another facility in, in order to save up and spend $40, $50 or on that, or I spend, let's say, how, many, how much is a pair of low-key sneakers, Philip? $180. Okay, so if they're like, what, how, what's the just, what do they get, that extra money? What, what are they getting? Well, what good karma are they getting? Um, question for you, Philip, and then Ava, I'd love to hear like, what they're getting from Pangaea as opposed to that you know, shame purchase. Uh, I think that the future of brands is what they stand for. You know, mm. it, it goes back to the days of Nike about building that community. And I think you know, brands with purpose are, you know, as Larry Kling said, are the next brands, you know, the next unicorns. So I think with Loki, you know, we set up to try and use this kind of material to all the sneakers I made from recycled ocean plastic, and we give 10% mm. of our online profits to wildlife conservation charities, and we're ultimately trying to turn that tide on, on wildlife destruction, because it's something so, so close to all of us. Um, so I think you know, you're investing in a brand because they have a purpose. You know, like one of my favorite brands is Patagonia, mm. and just you know, the pushback they're doing on the government, and you know, just leading that charge for all of us, knowing that we can all have you know, clean, breathing air, because Patagonia is there to say no when you know, one of the administrations comes in with a policy to get rid of Greenland. Mm -hmm. um, so I think people are, you know, what we are looking for is creating brands that mean something so people can get behind them and also you know, support them where they can with the protest, but knowing that they will be there to, to be at the front line. Okay, so every step they take in a pair of Lokis, they can every single step think that it's a step towards something better rather than you know, that $40 pair of sneakers, right? Like, I guess that's the, it's like to, to know that that's what you're spending your money on, right? Yeah, and I think it's about longevity, about creating great products that will have that longevity that they won't be, you know, destroyed after you know a few days usage, right? It's mm -hmm. about a good product which can last, you know, for for years and it's mm. timeless, so it's not depending on seasons. Okay. Um, but ultimately, for us, it's all about purpose. It has to be woven into the DNA. Mm. And Ava, yeah. okay, yeah. hold that. We're going to come straight back to you. And Ava, tell me, you know, if I if I have that choice again, my five pound T-shirt from Shane or however much it is from Pangaea, what am I getting if I save up and, and acquire that item from Pangaea? What is in my hands that's so much better that I maybe can't see, because it may look to those who aren't really used to looking at examining fashion that closely, what if they can't see the difference, for example, what are they getting that's like woven into those seams or into those fibers that they can't yeah, see? Yeah, I mean, I've a, a T-shirt at Pangaea could be 65 or $75, mm. so I know it's not for every wallet. Mm. I hopefully you get better quality mm. and you, uh, uh, particularly you buy into some values mm. um, and you support an ecosystem and a supply chain and a value chain mm. that is different. Yeah. And I think we have to think about our purchasing as a way of voting. It's our way of telling directions into society. Mm. And that's, it's a, that's a luxury, of course, that some have more of and some less. Mm. And, mm. and I think it, and it's really important that it doesn't come across as arrogant when you say don't buy mm. fast fashion because I think the the one point that I don't like about the fast fashion is that it's it's fueling overconsumption, mm -hmm. so it 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 you know it, it gives us an opportunity to buy way more than we need, because if you just need one t-shirt, then buy one t-shirt yeah. or whatever price point, um, yeah. and then keep right. it longer. Because I mean, actually, the most sustainable product that 
y that you that you can get is the one you already have. Yeah. So and and I yeah. know that that is a scary concept for an industry that is again back to the yeah. you know growth pursuit, um, yeah. and that's why we need to look into the more you know new business models of yeah. repurposing products. Can we resell it and use it again, or yeah. what can we do with it? What can we do with the yeah. fibers instead of dumping yeah. them like Lewis in Africa and, Africa become and themselves again, polluting right. and the environment you, yeah. and yeah. you know disrupting their whole yeah. p possibility of you know I mean Ghana is a place where they receive. You know, tons, market, tons yeah. and tons. Like anyone out there watching this, Google Cantamanto market fashion, you'll see these yeah. it's toxic insane. piles of just. Yeah. Really so we need filthy. to get all of that product back yeah. into the loop so it can yeah. be repurposed, quite right. remade and made. You know, the and fibers are worth get. something, and I think it's the wastefulness right. of fashion that is the biggest problem mm. we have, and that the price makes it more wasteful, right? So yes. if you don't pay so much, you're also maybe a little less... You don't think of it as yeah. valuable, right? Whereas if you yeah. pay it more, you keep it longer, you yeah. maybe repair, like, you know. So yeah. yeah, it's a little bit back to the roots. And we're, we're getting becoming more and more people on the planet. So everybody's yeah. going to grow anyway. Yeah. <laughs> we don't <laughs> need to Lewis, sell the three yeah. T-shirts instead of one. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I know you said you had something. Well, I, I, yeah, my devil's advocate, I think you were kind of hitting on it, which is we do have to remember that most people on the planet cannot afford to buy a lot of the products that are built in a sustainable way or that we're going to care for longer because we spent more money on them. A lot of people really are, most people on the planet are really you know, struggling around how they can afford food and shelter and clothing. And so as we continue to have climate crisis and issues around environmental refugees and climate justice issues, we're going to have more and more people that are really pressed around that way. So there is a role for lower price point clothing. But to your point, and I totally agree, if it's an economics game and if you treat whatever you buy with the same level of value, and I'm certainly not a perfect purchase s spender and consumer as much as I work in the space, I'd like to think that I am, but I know that I have products that I bought at these fast fashion companies that I've had for 15, 20 years, and I hold on to them. Now, maybe that I'm in the anomaly, because, yeah, if you spend less, you tend to not care for it as much. But I think if we can also do a both and with what we're sort of all saying, which is if you are going to shop and buy, you know, something that it's something that you do still continue to treat in a way that goes back if into the, the system. The quality is good enough. And I think then what happens is less purchasing which means those companies will have to raise price points, yeah. which means they can actually potentially put some of that margin back into better product. And so then you will always have the lower ones come back in underneath because there will always be the demand for the lower price point. So, you know, it's a vicious cycle yeah. as long as consumption remains. But I think there's an interesting economics game to that. that I don't know. But I'd like to hear from Samad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I've got a question. I'll tell you what, I'm you can talk to my nope. staff. Okay, you hold on. You guys said, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll share. Like we sh fashion could become the sharing economy. We're going to start with the microphones and show you how it's done. Um, now, Samata, the, the question I had for you is that in this idea of this excess consumption that uh, Ava and uh, Lewis have just expanded on, I, one of the issues I identified in a white paper I wrote recently was, you know, how if we're going to have to try and make change, what do you do when you get to the problem of influencers, right? Because the, if you go on, on social media now, you see these things called hauls and drops. Now, when I went into fashion, it was called a collection, which is kind of quite an elegant way of summarizing something that somebody spent months designing and thinking and ideating. But now it's called a haul and a drop, which makes it sound so devalued for a start, right? Yeah. And influencers, they have every right to make a living and they have a bottom line, but a lot of that comes from paid partnerships with fashion brands. Yeah. And that, in turn, emulates the same celebrities that you see a lot of in your work, and I've mm -hmm. seen a lot of styling some of these A-listers. Mm -hmm. and, and Philippe knows about that, because, by the way, he got invested in by uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. We're going to give him a round of applause for that later. <laughs> um, but you know, I think a lot of it is that a lot of young people out there, the TikTokers, they want to emulate this idea of fame and celebrity. Mm -hmm. So they will then follow the influencers who then encourage them, OK, go and buy a haul, buy a drop, and get a new outfit for every year appearance, which is like their kind of pop-up on the red carpet or the mm -hmm. press junket. So what would you say to influencers who attempted to promote that or those who follow influencers thinking, well, I'll just run to Shane or Primark or, mm -hmm. or even somewhere up, you know, in the middle of the market, but they just want to, what would you say to them? You know, I, I, I struggle with this um, kind of concept of influencers only influencing w in one direction mm -hmm. because I think the concept of influence can be exerted in many different ways. Now, you do have influencers who are promoting essentially the fast fashion model, mm. which is to consume, 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 
where it wants, throw it away. And obviously, categorically, I don't agree with that. I think there's a missed opportunity with influencers to kind of show the many different ways you can participate in fashion that don't require you to always purchase something new. And we did this incredible academy um, with Zalando recently where we talked to influencers about educating their kind of watchers mm -hmm. about everything from citizen um from vintage and second hand to diy to creating to learning how to make to rewear to rewearing things they already own and styling that in numerous different ways and we tried to show them that the fashion mark that the fashion model has to move away from purely pushing products to like almost a product and services market where it's mm -hmm. training people it's giving them new skills it's showing them and empowering them to use their own creativity and i think my biggest issue with i think the influencer and tiktok culture is i think it underestimates people's ability to be creative and for me fashion mm -hmm. is supposed to be an exploration of creativity it's supposed to be kind of standing out, it's finding your own mm -hmm. things, it's customizing your own things, it's making your own unique stand. And I think under the tsunami of kind of push, 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 sell, 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 we've just kind of devalued that and we've devalued what's being made. Um, I also think there's a missed opportunity when it comes to just educating people about the history of fashion. When people talk about vintage, for example, I think we talk about vintage and the fact that we're wearing something that exists and has been there and extending the use of that garment, but we don't talk about fashion history. Mm -hmm. We don't take vintage as an opportunity to educate people about how things used to be made. Mm -hmm. So there are all of these missed opportunities to just add intellectualism, to add depth, to add meaning to mm -hmm. what clothing actually means and represents. Mm -hmm. So it's tricky because part of our work is with a form of influencer, which is talent. We work with talent for the Oscars, for example. Mm -hmm. We worked with Billie Eilish most recently, this Oscars. But what we try and do with them is say, what is a passion or what is a subject that means something to you? Mm -hmm. Like for Billie, her thing was climate. Um, with Emma Roberts, it was secondhand and pre-loved. With Tati Gabrielle, it was the making craft. It was discovering herself to be a maker. And so we try and say, let's focus on that and communicate that out to the people that watch you and inspire them to follow suit with that. Instead of saying, like, we're here to get you to get people to buy stuff. So I think that's just a different conversation we're trying to have with influencers and talent. Um, and I, I think we're all influencers, to be 100% mm -hmm. honest with you. Mm -hmm. It's just what we're choosing to use our platforms for. That's the mm. big distinct difference. Well said. That's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. what I Thank think. Thank you very, very, very much. Um, and um, and uh, so if that's what you would say to them, mm -hmm. Lewis, you know, you deal with CEOs and you, you know, deal with really high level people in the work you do. What would you say to all the CEOs and the other really senior decision makers you meet out there, investors, the, the, the money people, the private equity, the VCs who are powering some of the fashion brands, what would you say to them mm. to, you know, to try and get them to think about? Um, yeah. Well, I, th I think the ones that, that I talk to or know are part of the reality of the direction that it's headed. I really do. I'm also an optimist, so you can pick apart everything I say and be like, oh, that guy's just an optimist. But I really do feel if you are a, a CEO of a fashion brand today and you're not thinking about the direction of where your company needs to be in 10, 15, 20 years and aligned to the SDGs and aligned to the future of humanity on the planet, you know, then you, you're kind of missing the boat. And one of the things that I've thought about for years is this sort of um, – metaphor that you hear sometimes about like flying to Mars and setting up a new colony and to me it's like here we are in very close to the Holy Land Mount Sinai and all that I think about Noah's Ark and I think about like we're really facing another one of those whether you're spiritual or religious or not this is what climate crisis is we're going to lose a large part of human population we're going to lose a large part of the planet where we can live and so this is a time where if you're going to survive as an individual as a society a culture a country or a brand, <laughs> you better be part of the solution, which means you better design yourself to be that your business is part of the solution or else you've missed it. And I think whatever that means to you as a CEO or a, you're a leader and you, take, you have a stake in this, it's a tremendous amount of power and it's a tremendous amount of opportunity to change markets. But it also takes courage and it's bold and, and you can get tossed out if you do it wrong. But I think, that's, I think this is the time to be bold and courageous and be willing to get fired for actually aligning yourself to the right direction. And that's going to mean really looking seriously at the way we've created capitalism. <laughs> yeah. and, and that's a big part of it. And the production consumption model and what, what, it, what it means to be profitable. I'll say one last thing on it, which is when I go back and think when we civilized ourselves and we stopped hunting and gathering and we colonized ourselves, we kind of – P different people formed different products and services. I was the guy that did the cheese. She had the milk. We had a barter system. You know, she made the shoes. I got the leather, you know. 
And so it was about pride. You did something. You had a value. You were known for that. Your last name became that. Your family was known for that. And we've lost all that. We don't really care what the product and service is as long as you're returning shareholder value. It really doesn't matter what you make or do. There's no value. You know? And so I think this is the time in society and humanity where you just absolutely have to revert to pride and why you're here. Are you on the ark? Are you going to be in the flood? So Matter, I know you had something to say about that. Yeah, and it's, it's actually tying to what Lewis just said and that earlier concept of a utopia, which mm. I just wanted to connect. And, and th th my utopia, which actually links to what Lewis just said, is involves a complete decentering of this conversation because I think we've also fooled ourselves into thinking that we are reinventing the wheel. And I think what happens when you travel across cultures and you travel across continents is you recognize that we aren't reinventing the wheel and that there are ecosystems and cultures that have thrived and demonstrated mm -hmm. these principles and actually tried to hold fast and steadfast to them in the face of a system that they feel is almost foreign to what they agree with. I remember having a really great conversation with a collective of, actually it was a multi-generational family, like a, 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 a kind of grandma, great-grandmother, daughter, granddaughter, um, Bangladeshi family, and in the same room I had some cousins from Ghana. And, mm. and I remember the conversations there were, this is not new to us, and in fact where this kind of business model is going is something we've always pushed against in our culture, we took great pride in loving the things we have. We took great pride in looking after the things we have. My daughter has something that my great grandmother gave her. There was this idea of circularity is not new. And I think if we can just, my utopia is just recognizing that and allowing ourselves to immerse ourselves in those cultures again and learn from them and respect and recognize that we're returning to mm -hmm. how we were. We're not going on this new adventure. Mm -hmm. And I know that fashion likes to pride itself on something new all the time. But in doing that, we're doing ourselves a disservice because we're searching for something that's already there. So mm. I love what Lewis said about this kind of return to almost looking back to how we used to hunt and gather, how we used to approach things. And I think that's like so critical mm. right now because yeah. we have continents and, and thought leaders we need to be listening to for our solutions. Yep. And they aren't all in the global north. In yeah. fact, a lot of them are in the global south. Yes. Um, and that so. last bit on my utopia is that distribution of wealth in the value cycle. I would love for when a brand does incredibly well, the raw material, the um, garment manufacturers do incredibly well too. It never mm. reaches back. It oh never yeah. reaches up to that kind of beginning source. It only cool. gathers and accumulates at that end. And yeah. I think a utopia is where there's an equity to profit. There's an equity to growth. Mm. Um, that isn't kind of doesn't erase the yeah. core contributors. Unlike she who recently got outed mm. on Channel Four for paying three cents per garment to their workers, I mean, unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. I think to your point about it's almost like you know you look at so we had some indigenous leaders up here at this amazing space earlier, and mm. you look at how their communities have thrived for thousands of years by taking, you know, things. If there's any waste, they use them, and I think that takes me on to you, Philippe, which is to think about, you know, how is it that your product your product takes ocean waste, right? And then, and what would otherwise just become pollution, uh, and ruin the seas and the ecosystems out there and in, in, in under the waves. So how does that work? So in, a, in a, it kind of because to me it sort of slightly like replicates how if you ask an indigenous leader how would you design your sneakers, they'd probably do something a bit like that. Be like, well, we've got all these things lying around, so we'll make that into something, right? Is that kind of? Yeah, well, actually, you know, only nine percent of all plastic is actually recycled. Um, specifically, if you look at PET bottles, you know, in the U.S., it's only twenty-nine percent. So there's this huge opportunity of, of you know feedstock that is you know going into the oceans or into landfills. Um, and I think you know there's so many brands now which are so aspiring to see at COP who are saying, hey, there's a second life for this material. And obviously it's not perfect; it's not a cradle to cradle to grave solution, but it's definitely a step in the right direction. Mm. Um, I think that's what you know I'm inspired to say. Okay, how can we make sure that you know we're taking this waste, we're giving it a, an opportunity to become a product, and then we're giving back? Um, I think to some other points, you know. You know, I've been to a lot of factories in China, and, and it was one of the things that always stuck with me is that, you know, the better you did, the better the factory boss did, and it never trickled down. Mm. And now with this local production, you know, in Europe, you know, you see as you grow, like these towns in Portugal are starting to grow as well, and the community thriving, and it's, you know, of course, in a way, it's been a good thing that China's become a little more isolationist, so that companies are now coming back to Europe and paying more for their product because it is having an, an effect on the community, and people are seeing it. Um, I think back to honestly on the utopian kind of conversation there to go a bit far right field, you know, what's been really interesting to see with our community is, is the desire to go online. Um, you know, that metaverse world is used so much, but, you know, when you actually look at it, especially in these developing countries, they are expressing their creativity there online. 
Um, and if you look at brands like Balenciaga and Fortnite, you know, they, they, they recently announced that last year they did two billion in sales just on Fortnite, selling skins. So there's yeah. such a demand for this product and there's no waste for it. Mm. Um, so it's, you know, it's a win-win, you can express your creativity and I think we've been super cautious about that now, but now we've jumped in two feet. We've just done our first collaboration with uh, Aglet and Metaverse. You know, it's a, it's a number one downloaded app in Ukraine at the moment. Wow. So during the war, this country is still making sure to go and express themselves on the metaverse. And it's just amazing now that as brands, you can go there and engage with consumer. You can have a positive message. You don't have to make product. You can still generate a revenue which provides purpose. Mm. Um, and it's just really exciting to see what's happening there with this younger consumer uh, where you know they're more conscious, but they still want to be an mm. individual. So I guess it's going back to Samata's point yeah. a bit. Like, there's nothing wrong with self-expression, right? But so maybe the the metaverse will allow people to express themselves without ever actually having raw materials involved, yeah, it, yeah, or yeah. slave labor, or something. I in think that the more even you know being in my 30s, the more mm. you enjoy yeah. even you know being in the metaverse. It always seems like it was it was for the younger generation, but you start to it's, it's quite addictive and it's mm. quite interesting to play. And mm. you know, we all grew up in you know with SimCity and all the rest of it. But yeah, I think I really am positive about that future of less you know consummation and more just online and, mm. and expressing individuality so um yeah. anyway we'll, we'll see where that goes yeah. but we're definitely positive Thank about you. it well i guess in that respect we're kind of you know we have to look back to go forward and i think that that leads me on to a question for ava which is you know ideally fashion would go back right go back to how the indigenous peoples they dress themselves go back to the same model that you talked about lewis but Unfortunately, we've now hit the 21st century. We've got used to certain things, so we kind of have to go back to go forward. So I guess, Ava, the question for you is like, how is it that I, I get the sense that at Pangaea, what they're doing is kind of replicating some of those ways, right? The way that Mother Nature operates herself by being incredibly innovative and, and not wasting things. And But do you think that if other brands embrace the kind of science and innovation and technology that you see at Pangaea, do you think that would, you know, if that was adopted more across the mainstream of fashion globally, would that, would that make it a lot cleaner and greener, the industry? No, absolutely. I mean, if you look at the life cycle of a product, the biggest environmental impact sits in the production, and it's the mm. sourcing of the raw materials and the treatment of the materials and so mm. on. So I think that is really environmentally a big, you know, a big area to look at. And mm. I mean, even for recycling, it's super, super complicated because ocean waste is waste, and it's super polluted, and it needs to get out of the oceans. But we also see supply chains that are you know, fully in their own circle with plastic bottles that should stay plastic bottles. They should not become a dress. Mm -hmm. They should stay there and we shouldn't take them out and then turn them because into Because what it takes a lot of other chemicals to go from being a plastic and bottle to being I mean a dress. At the end of the day, right. even, I mean, and we, uh, we also have recycled nylon in our collection until we have a better replacement, which is coming, uh -huh. um, which will be you know, bio-based and biodegradable, but um, that to come. Um, but yeah, so, and I think it's just really important where you source those. Um, but I mean, recycled nylon or polyester still remains polyester, mm -hmm. yeah. and it shreds microfibers and so on. But um, yes, absolutely, I think material innovation is a big step and an important step for the industry. And and even if we look like we're mostly a brand, we're actually also a B two B platform. Yeah. And like many others, um, you mm -hmm. know, supplying the industry with access yeah. to our. IPs and you know happy yeah to help and and have more companies unlock that journey okay. by joining uh, by joining forces. Um, but one other thing that I wanted to mention because we've of course Pangaea is a lot about science and innovation and it's more tech and we talk metaverse which I think is a big opportunity for the influencers who want to change clothes every day for, mm -hmm. a, for a photo. They could just um, do a digital. <laughs> they clothing, could just do right? a digital one. Mm. Um, but fashion is also a lot to do with agriculture and nature. Mm. And we sometimes miss, I think, that a little bit because we, yeah, it looks, I it doesn't look so much like it has so mm. much to do with nature, right? But we saw so many natural resources. Yeah. And that whole area is sort of missed also here at COP in this bigger climate mm. conversation, I think. The yeah. potential that nature sits on all of the solution that it holds mm. if we manage and restore and protect it in a different way. Mm. And that goes all the way back to the field. Yeah, like, I mean, uh, Egypt is famous for its cotton. We're yeah. sitting, yeah. everyone has probably seen Bedlin and other things marketed. It's Egyptian cotton is great, but yeah. a lot of people aren't aware, are they, either that, you know, in certain places like India, there are farmers who end up killing themselves. It's a well-known thing, this, these suicides across India, because farmers... Yeah get pressurized by companies like Monsanto to buy their seeds at a very, very elevated prices and then to deliver certain quantities. And when they can't, the sense of honor that's gone, yeah. you know, they're not able to feed their families, they end up killing themselves. Yeah. So I if anyone out there is thinking about buying a cotton t-shirt or ending cotton, do you want to be wearing something that's maybe uh, part of an ecosystem that encourages suicide? I mean, 
is nuts, right? It's completely yeah. nuts. And I mean, 60% yeah. of the world's textile fashion is dominated by the fossil fuel based. Um, yeah. But around 30% comes from cotton and yeah. only 1%, less than 1% is organic. Which is insane. So we're still at a stage where there's yeah. so much conventional cotton produced. Mm. Mm. And the monocropping, which is also resembled in all other food and agriculture, um, mm. it is really bad for the soil. Mm. Uh, you, mm. you know, and the tilling of the soil, mm. the pesticides used is killing natural habitat and biodiversity. And yeah, I mean, it, it might not feel like it's very fashion to talk about mm. soil mm. and But nature, it's so important. But we have to. Yeah. yeah. And we have to be yeah. mindful about how we source those natural resources as well. And uh, yeah, the, the shift right now, uh, the big buzzword is regenerative. It's being exploited already. Yeah. Yeah, I met somebody who did regenerative yeah. travel. Yeah. I don't know what that is. <laughs> it's, it's used everywhere and misleading. So yeah. we definitely need to put up the right guardrails or parameters yeah. for what yeah. regenerative cotton or other Actually products is. means. Yeah. But it's uh, on both on practice and outcome base. Mm. But it's such an important journey and we need to, to kickstart it to unlock nature's potential to be this carbon sink yes. and, uh, and help us solve yeah. a lot of the issues that we're facing. I yeah. think that takes me on. I was going to ask you, Lewis, actually, yeah. yes. No, no, you go ahead, go right ahead, go right ahead. Mm -hmm. right well, well, while we're on the utopia topic, yeah. um, local systems. I mean, we're also talking about, like, creating value and wealth. I mean, what we do when we send our clothes to Africa to disrupt the artistry, the production, you know, small batches, local batches. I mean, and this is a large part of it. One of, one of the things I, when I flew here on an airplane, <laughs> emitting a lot of carbon, yeah. um, Delta had the little bags that had your toiletry kit in there with a QR code of the person who hand stitched it was an artisan in Mexico. Yeah. And I looked at it and I went and I looked at it and I've seen other things do this, but I'm like, this is the return yeah. we need. And you know, I'm sure there's fault, faulty issues with that product, but you know, in a lot of, a lot of ways, I think there's they're onto something, which is really around this relationship building that we're talking about with local systems, which we're going to have to get to eventually when, as we're disrupting these fragile supply chains mm -hmm. and start building those resilient systems now. So, mm -hmm. yeah. thank you. And Samantha, on that note, could you? I mean, I think to this point of like going back and, and doing things locally, as Lewis has described, like, could you tell us like? A little bit about that in Ghana, like like what it might have been 50, 100 years ago, and now what has happened there with Cantamante Market? Because I'm sure a lot of people, I, I often tell people, do you know what goes on in Cantamante Market? And they don't. Tell us a bit about yeah, that because so it's kind of a metaphor for what's wrong with fashion generally. If you look at Ghana, right? Like yeah. ancient clothing, technique, craft, materials, and then now that it's just swamped with. Yeah, so waste. it's yeah, it's so interesting. So we had like a thriving textile industry and. We had fabric made that was kind of um, made from uh, kind of bark, tree bark, kind of really resilient, tough fabric, actually, kind of fabric worn by chiefs and, and stamped with natural dyes with really powerful symbols called adinkra symbols. And it was kind of our pride. And people associate often kente cloth with West Africa, but kente cloth and those kind of really bright ducks, uh, kind of bright prints are really kind of or originated. They're Dutch in origin, we had our own kind of really powerful indigenous textiles. Um, and what essentially happened was, I guess, an infiltration of the market. And so kind of domestic production of textiles and our own kind of textile ranges were essentially kind of forced out by cheaper, um, kind of poorer quality alternatives, predominantly from Asia. I mean, China was one is one of the biggest suppliers of like competitive textiles for Ghana's domestic textile industry. So what you have is a loss of trade um, for kind of Ghanaian people. And then you have also the issue of the younger generation who are almost coming, becoming more familiar and acquainted with these newer, cheaper textile options and just a new way of designing. And I think what we don't talk about sometimes is like the, the almost threat of loss of culture because mm -hmm. that's what it is. You have, it's the same thing you hear with families where maybe the father or the great grandfather were fishermen and it just doesn't become a viable career solution for the next generation. And so that's what's happening. You kind of don't have that viable career option because it's been becoming obsolete. But what's happened with Ghana is essentially a lot of the time people think that when they're donating clothing to charity shops that it's uh, like a goodwill gesture and you know it's going on to a good home, somebody that really needs it, someone who can't clothe themselves. But you know ultimately that's not quite the case. We buy so many clothes that you know I think it's Oxfam released a figure that 70% of the clothes that get donated to Oxfam just get sent over to the continent of Africa and to uh, predominantly to West Africa. 
Um, and they're kind of forced to accept these. There was a condition where a few companies, um, countries gathered together and said, we don't want to accept any more waste. And they were basically threatened with trade deal expulsion. So they were basically told, if you don't accept these secondhand clothes, you will be frozen out of lucrative trade deals for your country. So they had to accept it. And so we're just inundated. There are markets where it's just stacked to almost block out the sun with clothing. It's in Labadi Beach, it's in our waters, it's just clogging up our, our water, it's clogging up our landfills, it's clogging up our earth. Um, and it's a really tragic situation. And, and actually the Ghanaian community, um, there's a saying, it's like dead man's clothes, dead white man's clothes, because they don't understand. They think someone must have died for so much to be sent over, like somebody must have no need for these. So it just shows you that there's just this polarity of how we see things, this idea of being a good, doing a goodwill gesture versus the reality. And, and Lewis alluded to it as well. What it also does is it suppresses local talent because they're competing with something that they can't compete with. And I actually wanted to say my utopia also just allows certain words to be used and applied to different people because I find it hard to accept that the word couture is so easily applied to Parisian work, but it's so difficult to apply to like a Ghanaian or a Nigerian designer. And that is because we have a perception of who's allowed to use these words. And it's the same way that these local designers are not allowed to thrive. They're not allowed to compete with New York, London, Milan, Paris. And that's what we're doing. We're kind of burying them with clothes and we're also suppressing their ability to create. Um, and I know it feels quite doom and gloom, but it can just be redirected. Like with the red carpet campaign, we're so trying to encourage talent to even wear designers from different countries. Like stop falling back on the same brands. Mm -hmm. Like go further out, wear an, an Indonesian designer, wear a Ghanaian designer, wear a Japanese and designer. where would they find them? Where just literally just go do online. research. Yeah. Like yeah, there's, you know, there's Africa Fashion Week, there's yeah. the ethical, like there are so many clusters of, of collectives that showcase designers you literally just have to look mm. and I think that's another utopia for me I mean just to reshift and create space for these other domestic industries to really thrive and show their creativity Thank as well you. so okay, yeah brilliant. well I think we're nearly at time yeah. so I thought what we might just do is for those who are watching here in the room and digitally uh, online and live stream it'd be good to as all of these experts here I mean we you mentioned some of the terminology and I think that's also <laughs> one of the issues and I think a lot of people don't understand because greenwashing is so rife and it's only just recently in the UK where they've brought out some legislation against it but could we could you all just talk about like what does say something like circularity or organic and all these terms mean to you and how could we educate those watching and wider audiences is like what how to basically smell bullshit right <laughs> Where, because those, like circularity to me is when a, a, a product or system or process copies mother nature right like and, and circularity is not possible with the kind of clothing that gets dumped in Ghana and Cantamanto market because you can't pull out the stretch from the jeans and take the, so the zips or the buttons off that easily so you can't recycle that cheap clothing into something else can you so like, Lewis why don't I start with you because you know, uh, obviously, with cradle to cradle, and you've worked across so many sectors, what would be a few things you would say, like, these are the terms to look for, and this is what they should mean, or what they don't mean? Well, okay. Okay. <laughs> you know, I, th I think it's an interesting question. And, I mean, again, this we could we could take the whole panel on this, but I, I really like where you are with some of these words which started off as sort of pure, authentic words really have been taken by the marketing teams. Regenerative is a great one. When that word had kind of emerged on the scene a few years back, I was like, that's it, that's it, it's regenerative. And then I was like really excited about the definition of that word, and now you're seeing it applied to, like, you know, air travel or what. And so I think, I think that, you know, any word is subject to having its fault. It's hard to sort of break down which ones are right, which ones are good, you know, when you think about it. And it's also how that word plays out with um, an individual company or a brand. You know, it's different to everyone. I mean, having worked in the circular economy space, circularity was used widely about a lot of things. And where I really like, and I said this at the beginning, I really think of it, and it's the same of those pure words like regenerative, around like, um, restorative systems where it is that concept of we're putting back into it what we take out of it which is an indigenous wisdom too around like leave leave what you take pray for what you take ask for what you take return what you take and that you have this relationship that and I'm doing my hand like this as circular because to me it is that and I think if we are thinking about all of our exchanges interactions is like 
you know, the law of attraction or like what you put out, you're going to get back, right? And it's like an equal force or whatever the, you know, anyway, you know where I'm going. So I'm a little tired. But anyway, that, that to me is like, you know, the, any word can be used for good or bad, but it's really as you start to understand how they're using that word and try to understand what's behind it, you know, really. It's hard because, I mean, marketing is in this industry is really sophisticated in a lot of ways to trick you. Yeah. yeah. Actually, on that, just quickly, I think I love the work that was done recently with, um, I think it's a Citizens Consumer Watchdog, and I can't remember the name of the exact organization, but it was essentially a call out to kind of um, combat greenwashing yeah, the through CMA. labeling yeah. the CMA. Thank yeah. you. But what I found fascinating about this push to brands to be very specific about what you mean. You know, I have, um, I have a, a rambunctious four-year-old, and I have um, parents talking to me about what I do, and a mum came up to me, she's like, I'm really happy I got these organic cotton, like these organic leggings, and um, these organic cotton leggings. And I was like, okay, and she says, I feel really good about this, and I'm really into this whole safe fashion thing right now. You know, I'm feeling very passionate about people being aware that the clothes that we wear affect our bodies, our biospheres, the dyes, and so on. And I had to explain to her that, you know, the cotton is organic, but the dyes are not certified. So I think, you know, for her to understand that there's a process, like you've got the organic cotton, but the actual coloring process mm. of those leggings is a separate thing. That's mm. a non-certified synthetic dyes to get you that bright yellow with the green dots. You know, so I think this, you know, being really specific is important these days about exactly what you're referring to. Mm. And I think that and is to something out to look out for. Right? And what was beautiful about the CMA is that it was citizen-led. It was citizens approaching and mm -hmm. saying, we're really confused about the language. Mm. Can you give us tools? And that just shows you where people are at right now. Yeah. They do want to understand, but they want to yeah. know what exactly you're saying to them. Yeah, it's like another one would be like, say, vegan leather. I don't know if everyone's yeah. been attracted yeah, to vegan boot. leather. Yeah. yeah. Like yeah. the other day, actually, Samatra and I were both <laughs> interviewed for the same uh, the same article in The Hollywood Reporter. And they said to me, oh, let's talk about sustainable fashion on the red carpet. And I said, I'll give you a good one I read about the other day from my own alma mater, Vogue, where I, I've worked for 11 Vogues. And in Vogue recently, they wrote about a plant-based dress that Leia Seydoux wore, made by Louis Vuitton. I was like, oh, it's plant-based, is it? Okay, so it's as opposed to made of meat. That like was our dress. That's not that they called it they a plant-based plant -based dress. And I was like, oh my, like, and it's the same as vegan, like vegan leather. Like quite often, that's made of, of fossil fuels, unless it's, like, yeah. say, a grape leather like yours, right? So, like, that's a but really that big one. But that also has twenty six percent PU in it, which is plastic. Which is plastic. Yeah. It's water based. But you know, you need mm. to be transparent mm. about yeah. it all. Mm. And I think that's, you know, it's a good thing that we're having legislation come in mm. many countries that are going to demand that brands yeah. are more transparent. Yeah. I'm worried sometimes whether the consumer actually really want to know all of that or if have time or bandwidth. So that's why marketing teams have been good at sort of keeping it short or it's catchy simple, or, yeah. you know, making yeah. it easier to sort of digest. Yeah. Um, but the disclosure, the transparency is key. And people do need to go a layer below and actually understand a little bit more that it's not just the cotton, it's also the dyes or it's also, mm. um, yeah, all the steps of the road. And, yeah, I hope consumers are with us. I hope... Yeah. They're interested yeah. enough. Stay I mean, on the journey. We've we've applied something mm. called Eon. It's a digital passport in our clothes, so people can scan it. Mm. I don't have the data of how many actually does mm. do that, but I think to get let let the information be available. Yeah, and quick be super scan transparent the QR code, yeah. and actually break down what it is that you have in your products and be yeah. be honest. Mm -hmm. And and I think especially with taking those terms like you know calling something made of plastic vegan. It's crap. Yeah. And, you know, it, it really ruins illegal. all of the really genuine, you know, genuine work, work that some others are doing in yeah. this space. Yeah. But be transparent about what it is and what it mm. isn't. And mm. nobody's perfect. And there isn't a 100% route to any of it yeah. yet. But I think we're all on a journey, right? And yeah. hopefully consumers will join along. And I think yeah. maybe in my little utopian world, people would not be called consumers. I think we're citizens first mm. and foremost because yeah. we're not just here to consume. But... Secondly, we would believe fully that all we do have an impact. Mm. And I sometimes think that we feel powerless because of global problems being mm. hammered at us. And we think, okay, they're going to solve it at COP. The politicians are going to meet and they're probably going to do it. I'm going to continue to do what I do. But mm. actually believe that each and every one of us have an impact. Mm. What we do, what we say, what we spend our money on. Collective what we spend action. our Collective mm. actions, but also just individual actions. Mm -hmm. Because I think sometimes the connectivity is what c leaves us a little bit paralyzed. Like, does it even matter that I sort my garbage at home? Yeah. Where does it go? Mm. Who takes mm. care of it? And I don't even trust whether it goes or... Mm. And then if you can't, f if you don't feel connected 
and you don't see yourself plug into that bigger system, you go, oh, who cares, you know. Mm. Mm. I just go to Shen Thank and you. buy something crap or H&M mm. or whatever. So, yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Well said. And then Sorry, Mary. I just no, no, no please. Like let's, let's close. So I think, you know, from the little guy in the room, right, like 18 months old, I it's super complicated, you know. I think Your brand, you mean? It no, just in terms of the, the whole industry. Yeah. You know, we're, we're trying to look at the best material to use and people send you swatches and, you know, you spend hours analyzing it. Mm. So I don't, it's, you know, I think there's a lot of people who want to do good. Mm. It's just a really complicated industry out there. And I think if we can complement someone like Pangaea, who, we, you know, I think is such an amazing company, the way they share all the work that they're doing with brands mm. out there, you know, like Volvo giving the path and the way for its seatbelts. You know, I think that's what the industry needs. It needs more brands who mm. are willing to open up their book and say, hey, we're experts in this. Let us help you. Mm. And I think the brands yeah, like, like Allbirds, Ganny do that. Yeah, we, we want yeah. to use the right material, but it's just, it's, you know, we don't know, you know, like we're not scientists, you know, we're small teams of eight people. Mm. So I think I would encourage brands, and thank you, Pangaea, for, you know, for opening up those books so it does make us able to use the right materials mm. and to uh, yeah, hopefully have a better fashion. Yeah. It's kind of democratic rather than tyrannical in a way, right? I think with that, that's a very good way to note to end on. And I'd like to thank all my panelists very, very much for all of that wisdom and, and expertise. And, and uh, thank you to everyone who came up and who watched online. And um, if there's, is there any questions in the room? Anyone got anything? Yeah, have we got time for questions? Yeah, we do. Thank you. Sorry, I know we've run over. Um, but I wanted to know, um, from your perspective, what you think the responsibility of businesses are to educate, which is kind of a conversation that's flowed through. But for example, there are people who can't afford more sustainable options, but I have a lot of people in my network that can afford and do know, like things are shared on social media now. They are aware of but they're so disconnected from nature, from the supply mm -hmm. chain, and in, in their own bubble. And part of this, you know, it's not just the fashion industry, things like Amazon, thing, everything, we mm. get it at the snap of our fingers. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to uproot the capitalistic system tomorrow. So yeah. what, what is there a responsibility for businesses whilst they're innovating and doing this amazing work to change, like, the materials and the production also to educate otherwise how do people change because there are options out there i mm. i sh try and shop sustainably and go mm. to sustainable businesses but people don't mm. so how how do we move that i think that's the question so i might i might let you take that one since you advise businesses and ava as well I'd be happy, yeah i mean i think and pangaea is a great example i mean the responsibility i think to to share what you're doing and to be able to really educate and enlighten people about it is is critical I think, you know, to, to our last question about what you, you know, creating regulation or policy around what you can't say, as opposed to, like, do we create policy about what you, you should say, you know, and I think, th I think it's a very interesting question about what is the responsibility to educate consumers, because while this, I'll return to the capitalist model that we're currently under, the current one, and I'm not anti-capitalist, capitalism, but it needs to be conscious capitalism, it needs to be retooled, and I think there is a tremendous amount of responsibility that companies have around telling the truth, but they're not incentivized to do it because what, depending on the industry, whether it's personal care, plastics, consumer packaged goods, like nobody's incentivized to tell the dirty story of where stuff comes from and what happens in the supply chain. And I don't, I don't know exactly the answer to it, so I want to turn it to other people, but I think it's an important, important question. This is a good first question. Thank you. Ava, anything you want to add? Yeah, to no, that? I think there is a big responsibility. I think we, we also have something that's great to talk about. So, but I think it is a responsibility to disclose and help people navigate that space mm -hmm. because it is super, super complicated. And we went briefly down the route just on recycled fibers, yeah. right? Even that is difficult to navigate. So yeah. there is a lot of education needed. Mm -hmm. um, and I think brands, brands in is in a good position to actually do that because we have people's ear. Mm. Um, we have their attention and maybe we're mm. even talking about something fun. And if we can mm. also get them to then understand the bigger picture of what they fit into and sustainable doesn't have to be much more expensive I know mm. we're at a higher price point because we also work with material innovation but you can usually find for instance in organics and so on mm. price points that are accessible yeah. Um, yeah. but I yeah it's about you know meeting people where it's convenient for them so mm. I think price will always come first yeah 
But also mm-hmm. brands can educate now. If you think about it, the media are not gatekeepers anymore. Like the industry I went into 20 years ago, the media was the gatekeeper, but the, some of these titles are no, long, no longer the gospel anymore, right? So like any brand has its platform, it has content creation. So they have that facility, thanks to digital and social media, to st- tell their story, and right? Any, anything anyone else got to add to that? I do feel that they can educate, and I feel that they should educate, but I also almost have run out of patience with it. So I feel that there's an <laughs> element of like legislate, <laughs> like yeah. Yeah, the legislation up in here, because I just think it's happening, but it's just taking too long. And and I think there's like a reluctance to say things because, oh, but I'm not doing this. We get that with the brands we work with. Oh, if we step out with you, then we're going to be criticized about all the things we're not doing right, so we won't even bother. And we always say, like, we work, you know, with some of the brands that we've worked with, we're like, put a hurdles page up on your website. Like, just be real. Just say, mm. these are things we're struggling with as a company. Like, how refreshing would that be? Mm. Education doesn't always have to be, like, tooting your horn or just focusing on the things you're doing right. Education can be being transparent about your struggles and the hurdles you're facing. Mm. So I think that that's just something brands just need to do. But I, I am getting to that point now where I'm kind of like, time's going. So, like, mm. some legislation, please. You know, that's the other part of me where, you know, I'm just ready for that because I do feel anxious about how time is going, yeah, you know, really and how is. slow things are happening. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions <laughs> at all? No. Okay, I think we'll probably <laughs> wrap it there. <laughs> no, we're at time. Thank you all very, very much. If we could have a round of applause for my panelists, please. Thank, Thank you. you very, very, very much indeed. Thank you. Well done, everybody. Thank you.